Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. HDIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the Homeland Defense and Security Community. As such, our organization supports those working in the Homeland Defense and Security domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Homeland Defense and Security DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoyed this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD Homeland Defense and Security Research. All right, good day everyone and thank you for joining us for another uh, excellent webinar presentation. Uh, but before I introduce the presentation and today's presenter, I'll just give you a couple of administrative remarks uh, to, so everybody knows how this functions. Uh, first of all, all participants are muted. There is a chat function you should see probably in the bottom right hand side of your screen and um, uh, you can chat there. But um, if you have any questions, there's a three dot ellipses menu in the bottom right. And if you click on that, you'll see Q&A. And if you want to submit your questions there, that's the easiest and best way for us to be able to uh, capture your questions and be able to ask the presenter at the end of the, uh, of the presentation. Uh, if you would like a copy of today's presentation, it is up on our website at hgiac.org slash webinars. If you go to today's uh, uh, webinar listing, you will see an option to download today's presentation. You can get the PDF version of today's presentation um, for review. And then if you, miss this presentation or if you want um, to review it or send it to other folks we will be recording it and it should be up on our youtube page uh, no later than early next week uh, if not by the end of this week so uh, with that uh, i will go ahead and in, uh, introduce today's webinar presentation presenter uh, dr robert hayes uh, dr hayes is an associate professor of nuclear engineering at nc state university where he focuses on novel shielding technology, radiological air monitoring, and retrospective dosimetry for nuclear safety, nonproliferation, emergency response, and radiation protection applications. He currently holds a joint faculty appointment with the Savannah River National Laboratory and is an associate editor, editor of the journal Radiation Physics and Chemistry. He's also a licensed professional engineer in nuclear engineering, certified health physicist through the American Board of Health Physics, and a fellow of the American Physical and Health Physics Societies. He serves on the Advisory Council for Nuclear Security for the Administrator of the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration. And today's presentation is going to be a technical review on common myths about nuclear energy. And uh, with that, Dr. Hayes, I'd like to turn it over to you. Sounds good. Can you see my PowerPoint and hear me properly? Yes, I, yes, I can. All right, let's do this. So what we're going to be talking about today is the following. We're going to go over the nuclear fuel cycle, nuclear waste issues that are associated with uh, a lot of anti-nuclear narratives, and we're just going to talk about what is the truth. I actually spent uh, uh, over a decade at the waste isolation pilot plant before I moved over to academia, and I also teach nuclear waste management, so this is a particular specialty of mine. Then probably the most important thing is going to be radiological risk in context. What are the risks? How, how do you get different risks as a function of dose? Pretty critical if you're gonna make any kind of informed decision about anything to ha having to do with nuclear technology. Then we're gonna talk about the environmental impact. 
that's pretty important. That's there's a lot of narratives out there that nuclear is really bad for the environment. And then we're going to talk about nuclear accidents. There's a lot of narratives that uh, that are simply that these are infinite risk. And by putting radiological risk in context, we can actually talk about the radiological risk from the nuclear accident and then go over questions where people might have other questions on other things like proliferation or uh, uh, other aspects that are not at, at covered here, but we can we can address any questions at the end. So start off with the nuclear fuel cycle. It starts with dirt. You go to the dirt. I mean, unless you're extracting uranium from the ocean, you're you're getting it from the dirt. Uh, once you get it from the dirt, you've got to in, uh, mine it and, uh, and mill it, meaning that you do the same process as you do for almost any metal. You have a bunch of dirt, you, you make it very fine. Uh, with those fines, you then extract the element of interest or the mineral of interest, which in this case is the U306. Now, when you do that, that, that does remove all of the progeny from the uranium. So everything uh, from the all of the decay products of uranium go into those tails and is very fine. And so that becomes uh, a, a radiological issue for uh, waste management. Once that yellow cake uh, is refined and you've extracted that from the from the dirt, that mineral then gets converted into uranium hexafluoride. That then goes to enrichment. Uh, with the enrichment, you basically make that fuel have more uranium-235, the fissile component. Naturally, it's about seven tenths of a percent, but you need to enrich it up to about five percent for commercial fuel. That then can, gets converted into uranium dioxide and turned into little ceramic pellets about the size of the tip of your finger, uh, and then put into fuel bundles and then gets burned into a nuclear power plant and makes electricity. From that electricity, then the the spent fuel rods then would go to interim storage and then possibly to a deep geological repository. Ideally, uh, we would recycle so that when we're continually using that and even better if we were not only recycling, but we were using breeder reactors so that we could utilize all of the depleted uranium hexafluoride, the, the waste product from uranium from uranium enrichment, then we would be able to do far better because right now at a nuclear power plant, you use about 95% of the energy, the stored energy, uh, the nuclear energy of that fuel. And if we did reprocessing, then we could start to get far more. We could actually get 95% of the energy out and substantially reduce the, uh, the, the, the load on any kind of a geological repository, far less materials. And basically it just becomes the fission products, which are dominated by cesium and strontium, which have a 30 year half-life. So that would be ideal, but right now we're not quite there. So what is this new used nuclear fuel? This is something that can terrify people. It's basically when you talk about nuclear energy, sometimes people will talk about say nuclear waste as though that ends the conversation. And that, that basically to them speaks the entire conversation. Nuclear waste is the reason that some people oppose nuclear energy. And when you look at it, it's they're, they're, they're quite large, but even if we never made any more electricity with nuclear energy, we still have to dispose of the used nuclear fuel. And so that's something that we need a solution for, whether or not that's going to uh, enable or stop nuclear energy, we still have to have a solution. Interim storage is what we do now. With interim storage, we take those uranium pellets that were put into those fuel rods and put into those bundles that were then burned in the reactor, and we put them in these casks. Now, these casks, you might think, well, this has got to be really scary, right? This is the reason why people oppose nuclear energy. And yet, when you put them in a bundle like this at the fence, you, the, the fence isn't shown here, it's still got to be below 100 millirem per year. That would be the NRC license requirement for you to be able to actually store these and get a license to store them is that you got to maintain those boundary dose rates at 100 millirem. But you might think, well, what's 100 millirem? We'll come back to that later. Well, how bad is this problem? People talk about mountains of, of waste, or at least that's the, the, the kind of import or uh, uh, weight that's given to nuclear waste. And yet the truth is that for about the past 50 years, the United States has received about 20% of its electricity for 50 years, 20% of electricity from nuclear energy. That is an enormous amount of electricity. And you might think that that might generate an enormous amount of waste, but the truth is because the energy density from nuclear energy is so high, all of the spent fuel from all of that energy would not fill up a single football field above 10 meters high. Something that, that if you weren't aware of that fact, it's something to think about. That's how much nuclear waste is being generated and spent fuel 
that has people terrified. And as you saw from the previous slide, it's easy to control. It's easy to, to, to maintain in a, in a safe configuration. And yet it still terrifies people. But we need to talk again about radiological risk. What are the empirical risks in a quantifiable metric? These transportation casts, when you look at what does it require to get a license to build one of these? So to start off with, you've got to go through these this test sequence, a 30 foot drop onto an unyielding surface, a 40 inch drop onto a steel bar. Now, when you drop these, these have to be dropped onto the weakest point. You do a finite element analysis of the cast when you're going to design a cast. It has to be dropped onto the weakest point. Then it goes on to be dropped onto a steel bar. These are sequential. Then it's got to be burned for 30 minutes at almost 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. And then it's got to be submerged in 50 feet of water. This is like the worst case highway accident that you can imagine. And then the design, in order for it to get to a, in order for it to get a license, it cannot leak. Got to go through all four of those uh, those tests and no leaking. And then if you if you design a cast that can do that, the NRC will issue you a license to start building them. So they're incredibly rigorous, but that doesn't mean that the people still are not terrified of spent nuclear fuel transportation. When it comes to geological repositories, uh, another narrative that's commonly found is that there is no solution to uh, nuclear waste. And we actually have a licensed geological repository for transuranic waste here in the United States in Southeast New Mexico. It's the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant. And if you look at the stratigraphy, there, it's about a, the, the actual repository is about a half a mile down, and it's basically sodium chloride for miles and miles. The actual layer there, it's about a half a mile of sodium chloride and then about a half a mile of mixed calcium sulfate and other water evaporite. So it's about a mile thick of water evaporites. And so with that kind of geology, it is elastoplastic. So it basically heals itself when there's any kind of damage and it prevents any kind of water in leakage. If you do get amount, any water in, it's basically salt, and so you've got this enormous barrier to prevent any kind of transport from environmental processes. And so it's incredibly st uh, stable. The, the actual formation where the repository is about 200 million years and a about a mile thick of water evaporates. So it's incredibly stable. This is a, a cross section of the stratigraphy. And I, I like this photo right here. This is actually a miner. This gentleman is a certified miner by New Mexico. And he's got a belly box here remotely operating this miner. And it's basically just a big barrel with big teeth that just rotates and cuts up the, the salt. You can see the striations right here that enable the salt uh, to be mined. So it's, it's easy to mine and it's easy to make safe when you've got a, a, an appropriate budget. This is what it looks like down in the underground. This is an amazing thing to see. These, these are precision fork truck operations. The person out here is actually a spotter. And this person, the spotter, is actually controlling the fork truck. The fork truck operator is looking at this person and the, the, the real estate down here is incredibly pricey so that they very gently put these things basically touching so that you get as much bang for your buck when you're putting the waste in there. Now, that all sounds fine and good, but in 2014, there was a drum deflagration. So one of these drums that looks like this, a 55 gallon drum, had been improperly loaded with uh, uh, salts that literally deflagrated it. But for all intents and purposes, it was an explosion and it aerosolized about seven curies. Now, HEPA filters were in place and the safety systems worked and you got this, this resulting plume release. Now, this was validated that every time you see these little flags, that was a, a regulatory compliant air monitoring station that was monitoring this along with the effluent, where the effluent came out, that was being monitored. And so this looks terrifying, right? You got a geological repository for transuranic waste, plutonium contaminated waste. This was actually americium, but it's, it's, that's still a transuranic. Uh, and this can terrify you that this would happen. Yet, even though this is a validated plume, it was measured, the actual americium that was deposited on the ground from this, this was published in the Health Physics Journal, the actual americium that was deposited on the ground was comparable. This happened in 2014. The amount that was deposited was comparable to the amount that was deposited in the prior century from atmospheric nuclear weapons testing. So that terrified people that you would get that. The actual dose potential that you would get out here at this flag. So if you were standing right at the fence, if you're standing right at the fence when this happened, right basically at that flag, 
then you could have gotten upwards of eight milliram if you st stood there all day. Now, again, eight milliram, what is that? Is that scary? Is that bad? That could be scary if you don't know what a milliram is. If there's no context, if you don't have a way to assess that risk, you could say, oh my goodness, eight milliram, that's the same thing as 8,000 microgram, and you can just keep on scaling it up as you see fit. But the point is, is the safety features work so that this release, had it been planned, had it been controlled, would have been within the license issued to WIP by the Environmental Protection Agency. It would have been a completely legal release had it been planned and had it been controlled, but that was because the safety features work. It's a very expensive safety feature. So that kind of contextualizes where we're at and already by pointing out that this would have been a legal release. Now, a lot of people are afraid of nuclear waste because the argument is, well, how do you know, right? Civilization's only been around for 10,000 years. How do you know that geology is going to be stable? How do you know that geology is right? How do you know that you haven't got some uncertainty in there that you haven't accounted for that's going to give rise to dangerous releases from a geological repository? And what we can actually say in terms of disposal of spent nuclear fuel is that if you do it the way that Mother Nature demonstrated, that it could be safe, it's pretty much uh, 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 not reinventing the wheel. Uh, this was published in Physics and Chemistry of the Earth. Uh, there are a lot of publications that are out there. This figure comes from Scientific American. The point is, is that the fissile component of uranium, that uranium-235, has got a half-life of about 700 million years, whereas the uranium-238 has got a half-life of just over 4 billion years. And so the uranium-235, the fissile component, is decaying away a lot faster than the parent or than the, the more dominant uh, fertile or fissionable component, uranium 238. And why that's significant is that it's not, it doesn't just tell us largely why the, the fissile component has such a, a small fraction because it's got a, a shorter half life. But if you go backwards in time, that means not only does it exponentially decay forward, it exponentially increases backwards in time. So if you go back about 2 billion years, the fissile, uranium-235, would have been about 5% enriched. So you don't need to do that, that artificial enrichment. If you go backwards in time, it naturally would have been enriched. So when geological processes concentrate the uranium in a given place, if you get enough of it, you put in some water, it can go critical. And that's what happened at, at Oklo Gabon. And the way that we found that is uh, here's a great example of uh, the neodymium isotope. So if you look at neodymium naturally, this is the distribution of the isotopes that you get. Uh, but if you look at neodymium from fission, it looks very different. They're completely different. The, the isotopes of neodymium that you get from fission are completely different than what you get from natural. And if you look at the neodymium from Oklo, it turns out it was basically an exact superposition. You had a little bit of natural and you had a little bit of the fission and the two gave you this resulting distribution that was completely different from anything else that had been seen on Earth. And so when you correct for it and you say, well, what was the neodymium after you remove the natural component? Basically, it was identical to fission. And so what this told us is that if you have stable geology like you have here in Oklo, it just stays there. That's kind of the definition of stable geology, and it will stay there for billions of years so that we can go back and see those fission products that decayed back down into, into stables so that as a result, you just got a very different kind of dirt. If you put it in stable geology, Oklo Gabon proved that you can safely dispose of spent nuclear fuel for billions of years, <clears throat> definitively. All right, so now that we've talked about some things, let's actually contextualize radiological risk. So let's go through a logarithmic scale of risk uh, and dose. So to start off with, a milliram. So I, where I was using milliram earlier. So, so to contextualize it, that's about what you get every day just from nature, from the radon, from the earth, from outer space, from the food we eat, all sources combined give you about a millirem per day. So that should give you a contextual feeling for radiation dose and what we're designed for, what we have evolved to be able to thrive in here in the biosphere. One millirem, that's about what you get just for living on the planet in one day. Now, four millirem, that's quite a bit bigger, and that's about what you get for a coast-to-coast -coast trip from New York to LA and back, you get about four millirem. That's also the drinking water standard by the EPA for a year. And we'll see that these regulations are intentionally extremely conservative, but this also allows people to feed into the idea that if I've got a standard that's like that, that must mean that having more than that is dangerous. 
So having more than four millirem per year could be dangerous if the EPA has a drinking water standard like that. And it does tend to allow people to convince themselves that their preconceived notions that nuclear is really, really dangerous is, uh, is being validated by these regulations. 10 millirem. This is the limit for the WIPS facility based on their license from their radioactive materials license from the EPA. 10 millirem per year to the nearest resident was what you can get uh, for uh, a license radioactive materials license from the EPA. It's also the minimum dose and minimum annual dose that you have to get just from internal potassium. Uh, that you have a gradient of potassium and sodium between the in, inside of the cell and outside of the cell. And that, that gradient uh, requires potassium to be in your cells and potassium is naturally radioactive. It's got a higher energy beta, higher energy gamma than you get from cesium. Uh, and that's the minimum dose that you get just from internal potassium. 10 millirem, also the EPA limit. 40 millirem, that's about the maximum you can get from potassium. Remember, you need to have that potassium sodium gradient in the cells. And so potassium content in the body scales with muscle content. A large muscular male, they can easily get 40 millirem per year just from internal natural potassium, just being a healthy, muscular, large person. 100 millirem, again, we're going orders of magnitude here. 100 millirem, that's the public dose limit for any nuclear facility. So again, when we looked at those spent fuel casks, wherever the fence is, a cowboy at the fence that they decided to park there, they can't get more than 100 millirem per year if they live there at the fence. But that's also about the dose that you get for uh, a pelvis x-ray. So if you had, the, if you know somebody that broke a hip, they certainly had one of these, and that's about the same dose that they would have gotten from that x-ray. Again, going to be going up logarithmically here. 320 millirem. That's the total that you get per year on average in the United States. Now, we'll look at some graphs later to show how this can vary. This can vary a lot. It can be a lot higher or it can be uh, substantially lower. But that's the average for the U.S. population per year, 320 millirem per year, which is why one millirem is about the average daily dose. Now, a thousand millirem, that's a much bigger dose. That is enough for the EPA to consider evacuation. The, the, the more likely standard is two millirem the first year and half a rem every year after that, and then they would recommend evacuation. And to put that in context, that's the same dose, 100 millirem, that's about the same dose you get for a nuclear, uh, nuclear medicine stress test. So I've had one dose, I'm old enough that I've had a stress test. So I got about a rem or 1000 millirem from that. Or if you know somebody that's got a CT scan to the chest or hip, or uh, to the head, that's again about a thousand millirem. And this again feeds into the confirmation bias for somebody that thinks that nuclear is incredibly dangerous. Because if you're going to tell somebody that they have to permanently move from their home, that's got to be pretty serious from, in most people's mind. Why would you tell me to do that if it's not really scary and bad? Uh, but we don't allow people to make that informed consent. We basically say the governor issues evacuation recommendations, people are gonna follow. Uh, and that's what you're avoiding uh, in order to uh, 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 implement those emergency response criteria from the nuclear emergency support team. I used to serve on the, on the NEST and, and that was the criteria then and it's still the criteria now. Keep going up, orders of magnitude. So 5,000 millirem. Now, this is my dosimeter here at NC State. Uh, I'm allowed as a radiation worker to get 5,000 millirem. Uh, when I worked at the WIP, the same thing. When I worked at the Foreman about a test site, the same thing, that was a maximum. But you'd have an administrative limit that would be much lower. You'd even have an ALARA limit that was much lower. But this is considered safe uh, or allowable, in other words, safe, regulatory by uh, the federal regulations for a radiation worker. They can, you can get five rem per year, 5,000 millirem per year is considered safe for a radiation worker. Alara would actually throw you to lower values, but that's the legal limit is 5,000 millirem. Going up another order of magnitude, 10,000 millirem. 10,000 millirem is just the very threshold by which we are able to start seeing a statistically significant increase in at least one journal paper. There's only one journal paper that has this. Before that paper came out, it was about 20,000 millirem for adults. But by looking at children that went, underwent radiotherapy, we were able to see that you did have, because there was a large, large enough number of them, uh, they were able to get a half a percent. Now to contextualize that, average cancer rates for a member of the, uh, of the public, if you live long enough, 
on average, there's about a 40% chance that you're going to get cancer. If you live long enough, it's likely going to happen with, with about that probability. And 10,000 milliramp, that's just the threshold for which we can say that there is uh, empirical evidence that you are increasing your cancer probability, even if only by half a percent. All right, now 100,000 milliramp. Now we're starting to talk about really big doses. Uh, this is enough to increase your cancer probability by 5%. This is about the threshold for where you're going to start getting acute radiation syndrome. So now we're starting to talk about actual observable medical effects once we get up into these doses, as opposed to what's actually scaring people, the regulatory limit, which is many orders of magnitude lower. 500,000 milliramps. So now we're talking, these are the kind of doses that atomic bomb survivors had obtained. Uh, that is what's considered the lethal dose. Uh, right there around 500,000 milliramps. Uh, around 50% of the people that get that dose will die within about a month if they don't get medical care. So not everybody dies, but it's still considered lethal because you're gonna get a large fraction of people that are dying. And that's at 500,000 milliramps. And then by the time you get up to 100,000, or sorry, uh, 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 oh, this unit's wrong. This should have said uh, uh, a million uh, milliram or basically 1,000 rem. I, I apologize for that. If we're on 1,000 rem, that's where you basically have hospice. So to put this now in context, we just went over orders of magnitude. Now, this one milliram, that can even scare people. I'm a, a professor of nuclear engineering, and I teach health physics. And I've had students, I, I remember once where I started to talk about a milliram, and one of the students said, is that dangerous? So you don't know, it's just a unit. Unless you've been trained to know how to contextualize the risk, you don't know if a milliram is dangerous or not. And all of the values in this upper half here are where the regulatory limits are, where by the time you're at one rem, it's not regulatory limits per se. Now we're talking about emergency evacuation, but actual measurable medical effects don't occur until you're all the way down here. And so without knowing what a dose is, any of these could scare you equally because you simply don't know. How do you contextualize it? And so radiation risk in context is essential, in my opinion, to any to ever obtaining any form of uh, informed consent for uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, radiological exposure. So where are the ways that we got that we get those? We talked about a bunch of these already. Uh, turns out that the natural stuff that we get from radon and cosmic rays and food, that's comparable to what you get from medicine, from nuclear medicine and CT scans, what we get from the earth, even a little bit from each other because of internal potassium is a little bit. But when it comes to something like nuclear energy and radioactive waste, even though these terrify people, it, for all intents and purposes, is a negligible fraction of the dose that we get. We can see that here from this graph from the, uh, I got this from the EPA. It's also uh, posted on the National uh, Council for Radiation Protection. The point is, is that radon is the biggest chunk of natural radiation that we get. Radon, that's about 200 milliram per year. That's the largest chunk. But when it comes to medicine, because the risk versus rewards are so uh, low or the reward versus risk is so high when it comes to radiology, Basically, you can do treatments that now are outpatient where before you might have had to cut somebody, like for exploratory surgery. You can now do that in nuclear medicine in, in ways that are just amazing. So uh, the use of radiation in medicine has really increased over the years simply because you can do so much with it. Now, again, when it comes to nuclear energy, you can see this industrial fraction, tenth of a percent. And that includes things like industrial radiography and consumer goods. So nuclear energy is just a fraction of that. And yet that tends to be the one that scares people, even though it's just this tiny little sliver of the total dose that we get. That doesn't mean that it's not terrifying to people. It is terrifying to some people. Now, I did tell you that we were going to look at uh, uh, environmental doses. And what you can see here is how spatially the, uh, the environmental radioactivity changes uh, as you go, say, over the Rocky Mountains with potassium, with thorium, and with uranium. Now, when you talk about cosmic rays, the same thing applies. Once you get up high in the mountains, you get much higher dose rates. And so if you're on, on the coast, you're going to get much lower dose from cosmic rays. But this just shows you the variation that you have uh, as a function of where you're going to be, right? So, I mean, up in the, uh, the Rocky Mountains, you're going to get a lot more potassium and thorium and uranium. You can see in the Mississippi, uh, river uh, valley, you get a lot of those same higher values because all of the uranium and, and decay products 
uh, are being weathered down into the Mississippi Valley, and so they deposit there. That's a very natural process, and so you can get a lot of uh, variation in natural background as you go from one region to another. Another issue that people have with nuclear energy is that, that some people think that it has an enormous environmental impact, that you're just killing the earth and that it is incredibly uh, wrong to use nuclear energy because you're damaging the earth so much. So let's actually look at some quantifiable metrics that would address that. Now, the reason, the main reason why renewables are important is greenhouse gases. Uh, that's the biggest driver for solar and wind. And you can see that in this graph right here, where uh, the, the, the conventional uh, environmentally friendly energy sources all have low greenhouse gases. Nuclear is even lower than some of these others. And uh, one of the reasons I think this one is interesting is that geothermal is listed as renewable, but the majority of geothermal energy actually comes from the radioactive decay of potassium and uranium and thorium and their decay products in the earth. So it's just a converted form of nuclear energy like wind and solar, uh, where wind and solar are converted fusion. Geothermal is a converted uh, form of radioactive decay uh, from the primordial radionuclides in the earth. So the land use, uh, how are we, if we're, if we're talking about environmental impact, you wanna talk about the water, the earth and the sky. So if you look at the earth, how much land is being taken up? Now this only shows the graph of what's taken up for deployment. And you can see if you're using photovoltaics, the value is about 100 times more than for nuclear. And that's pretty significant if you want to leave the earth untouched, but you recognize we need energy. The energy density for nuclear just means that it requires such a small amount of land, and that's only during deployment. And it's only getting better with modern technology. This is the old 70s technology uh, right here, the stuff that we're using today. Well, probably the other biggest factor is material requirements. How much material is required per terawatt hour of energy that you get? In other words, how many mines do I have to have? How much milling do I have to have? How much manufacturing do I have to have? How much transportation? How much waste am I creating? And you can see if you don't like to have a lot of mines, then you can either go with coal, gas, or nuclear. So this is actually making coal and, and, and combined cycle gas look attractive because you don't have to have a lot of material requirements. You don't need to make a lot of metal. You don't need to make a lot of electronics. You don't need to make a lot of things as required for traditional renewables. And so if what you're interested in is environmental impact, it's looking like nuclear is going to be the best way to go because nuclear gives it to you in terms of area, in terms of greenhouse gases, and in terms of materials. It's just all around in the best category for each of those uh, uh, aspects to look at environmental impact. Nuclear accidents. Another thing that people will bring up when they're uh, arguing against the use of nuclear energy to provide our energy needs is they'll just say Chernobyl, or they'll say Fukushima, or they'll just say Three Mile Island, kind of like the nuclear waste statement. Once you make that statement, you think that that includes all of the uh, relevant information to assess whether that's a good decision or not. So let's go over these. Three Mile Island and Fukushima. These are Western designs. So this was 60s technology built in the 70s. Three Mile Island and Fukushima. Same with Chernobyl, Chernobyl. All three of these were technology, 60s technology built in the 70s that had accidents after they were built. Now, Three Mile Island, this one is the only one that's happened in the United States. Now, how bad was that release? It turns out that the total integrated dose to the average member of the population there at Three Mile Island was one millirem. So you remember that scale that I showed earlier, the highest scale, the smallest dose on that scale, basically what you get from one day of just living on your natural background, one day's worth of dose was what the impact from Three Mile Island was to the public. So that's just staggering how different the perceived risk is versus the actual risk that occurred. And that was because it had all of our safety features. It had a containment and, and it worked and so forth. Now, Fukushima, that's a completely different thing, right? You, you have this phenomenally huge tsunami that took out you know, 20,000 lives and it took out the nuclear power plant. When it did, it gave rise to this plume. And again, remember that uh, the, well, the, the, the same criteria that the EPA uses is, is 
pretty much the same kind that you you have internationally at two REMs, you're going to do an evacuation. And so they actually did an evacuation. And when you go back and look at the actual dose consequence, both the United Nations, World Health Organization, all the review papers pointed out that this entire release was insufficient to produce any measurable medical effects. Remember, medical effects don't start until you're at about 10 REM, but they started the evacuation in the one to two REM. So that the average member of the population that was close in there only got about a half a REM. So less than a, than a, a whole body, a chest CT scan or less than a head CT scan. And so that the only deaths that occurred from Fukushima were from a panicked evacuation. That's just staggering. It was because of fear that people died. It was only because of fear that they didn't do a, a, a controlled staged evacuation. It was a panicked evacuation and you had a few thousand people die. Now Chernobyl, this was just a really bad design. So three of the, the, the Western designs, they were made for electricity. Chernobyl had a dual purpose of uh, weapons production and electricity. Although with Chernobyl, it was a bad design. I, I have never met another nuclear engineer that wouldn't uh, concede to that. It was a really bad design. And uh, then it was operated in a very bad way in a very bad time. And then they had no emergency response. And so if you'd have actually done any one of those corrective actions, you'd have drastically reduced the impact. The emergency response would have prevented a few thousand cancers that occurred afterwards. There was up to around 4,000 cancers from actual changes in disease rates after Chernobyl, and there were many dozens of people that died from acute radiation syndrome. So acute radiation syndrome actually happened to some of the first responders to Chernobyl. The funny thing is, is that even with all that damage, it pales in comparison to the worst case that you get with hydroelectric. Bangkiao Dam back in the 70s in China, in the last century, when it went, it took out an approximately 200,000 people from hydroelectric. But hydroelectric really doesn't scare people. It doesn't have this mysterious radiation uh, uh, capability that's associated with it. A lot of people uh, will argue that we don't want to have nuclear energy because of terrorists, right? Like what's happening with Zaporizhia in the Ukraine right now. And that is a common argument against nuclear energy. Well, a terrorist could do something. Somebody could get in and, and cause an upset condition. But the law in the United States is that you literally have to have an impact of a large commercial aircraft and nothing bad happens. So it's kind of this paradigm keeps coming back up. But when you look at transportation, if you look at accidents, if you look at terrorists, we, we have a system that's designed so that the worst thing that could possibly happen is that nobody gets hurt. And when you have a technology that does that, that terrifies people, that says a lot. That says a whole lot that people are terrified of something where the safety that, that, that it's been designed so that the worst thing that could possibly happen is that nobody gets hurt. That's the design. That doesn't mean that nobody would get hurt or it's impossible. That's just the, the level of design. I, an analogy but might be to make a car that would allow you to go through all those same tests of the transportation package and still allow a person to walk away safe if they, you know, they got into a major accident, they rolled off a cliff, they got into a fire, they fell into a lake, and then they were able to get up and walk away without a bumper scratch. You know, you could probably design something like that, but it would be crazy expensive. Okay, there we go. The Department of Energy is now based what might be, uh, has now constructed what might be one of the safest trains ever built. And this is for spent nuclear fuel. And I'm not going to do the video because uh, I don't have time. But last but not least, there's this issue of how dangerous is it? How, because when you, when you think of when people bring up Chernobyl and Fukushima, people did die. The only deaths from radio, radiation were from, uh, to the public were from Chernobyl. But when you fold in all those accidents per terawatt hour electric year, you can ask how many people die from accidents? Well, According to this study, other studies actually have solar being uh, better, but uh, this study actually has nuclear being better. But basically, nuclear, solar, and wind are on par in terms of how many people die from accidents. From a wind turbine, right, you can fall off the turbine, you can get electric due to a solar, fall off a roof. So there are accidents that occur there, but nuclear is so safe that even when you fold in the stuff that occurred 50 years ago, it's incredibly safe. It's just incredibly safe. Uh, to the point where it's as safe as solar and wind. For all intents and purposes, it is just as safe in terms of deaths from accidents. 
This is just a plan of the future for a possibility for interim spent fuel storage so that we'll be getting this stuff off so that there is potentially a path forward that is being uh, ushered in by the Department of Energy. And I think that brings me at 45 minutes, the target, so that we can start entertaining questions. So, uh, are there any questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Hayes. And yes, there are some questions that have come in, so I'll just go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, the first question is, um, uh, well, the first question and the third question are kind of related. So, uh, I'll pose them together. And if you excuse me, my screen is, here we go. First question is, if the aggregate amount of waste is relatively small, why is long-term nuclear waste storage so controversial then? And then there was another question that is very related um, that you could probably address at the same time. It's, it's for spent fuel, given it isn't reprocessed, and given the relatively small amount, sorry, I can't get these notifications to go away. All right. Well, I sorry can... about that. And given the relatively small amount produced, why isn't dilution a solution for disposal? The fuel came from the dirt, so why can't any remaining spent fuel and waste be milled and mixed with removed materials from mining operations and the like until emissions are below regulatory limits and then be spread out pretty much anywhere? Is this just a perception political issue? All right. So I, I would say that there are two. Those those require two different answers. So the first one: Why is it such a a political issue? Why is it that why is there's no decisions made over it? And I would say that's largely due to psychology. Um, once a person has confirmation bias in place, once you associate it with a political stance, once you associate it in your mind with something that is intolerable, then then the psychology kicks in where you've got confirmation bias, where you're only going to be listening to sources that agree with your position and you're going to discount uh, uh, information that contradicts your your perspective. You're going to think that it's biased. You're going to think that it's uh, it's cherry picked. You're going to think uh, you're going to come up with rationalization to argue against your preconceived notions. Uh, a lot of it comes from uh, uh, a, a number of sound bites that you can have. Uh, Ralph Nader once said that plutonium was the most poisonous material on the planet, or something like that. And that one, once that resonates with you, you're going to to have that psychological bias. To start per perceiving things as as though uh, anything that contradicts that, say when you look at the safety of it, you're going to say, "Well, uh, I'm going to come up with an argument to say that that doesn't matter." Uh, so all the data that I showed you, you could discount it and say there's more important things, or you're uh, you're you, you can't be 100% sure of everything. And so there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Uh, one of my favorite um, narratives that followed along this was. You know, if if spent nuclear fuel is so safe, it's so easy to handle, then why do you got to dig a hole a half a mile deep and stick it in there? That doesn't make sense. And the truth is, well, you don't unless you want it to decay back down to natural background levels, right? It's perfectly safe where it's at right now. There's no problem with it. Those things are licensed for 100 years, so it is entirely safe. Um, and if we don't do something within 100 years, we're going to have to deal with the fact that those licenses are expiring, and we're going to either have to repackage it or transport it and dispose of it. Uh, and that's just because that's the, the level of safety that we expect when it comes to nuclear energy. Now, the second question, I have heard a lot of nuclear energy advocates point out, uh, try to argue the solution of pollution is dilution. And uh, my position against that would simply be that that opens up the potential for abuse. So you can indeed, I mean, the radiation, the radioactivity came from the earth and we do want to return it to the earth. But if we make the argument that as long as I dilute it enough, I can have an un uncontrolled release, uh, then you're going to potentially uh, open up the gate for uncontrolled releases from everybody. And you can make the argument that still that's not going to cause a, a radiological concern unless it gets abused. And so that's really the only reason that you would not, that I don't find the argument solution of pollution and dilution is simply because of that, that, uh, that you have that potential for abuse if you, you lose control over it at that point. And uh, I, I'm happy to have somebody disagree with me. That would just be my personal position on why I think that once you've created a waste, you should keep it concentrated, but handle it safely. Um, uh, probably the, the, the best analogy that I could come up with, and it might be a bad one, is human waste. Um, the problem with human waste is, right, if in, in developing countries, you, you still have uh, really big problems with dysentery and cholera because of that. 
But then again, you're talking about biological organisms as opposed to radioactivity. And so I would say that, I mean, unless you believe linear no threshold, you can argue those two are, are fairly dissimilar. So I hope that answered the question. Uh, a lot of subjectivity when it comes to that argument, the solution to pollution is solution. I don't favor it um, because of, uh, uh, my, I believe that it opens up the door or it, it makes abuse more attractive. And thank you. Uh, another question that came in, um, are there other adverse uh, effects from radiation exposure other than just cancer? Yes, acute radiation syndrome. Uh, if I go back to that, that chart, when, it's still up in the top level. Uh, when the, by the time you get way up here into these high doses, right, you get acute radiation syndrome right here. By the time you're upwards of uh, uh, 100 to 200 rem, uh, even though that's occurring, you start to have the effects of sterility. So if you get doses about this big, uh, hopefully you've already had children. Um, uh, if you, by the time you're up in these doses, you also have blood changes. You have the hemanopoietic syndrome. So there are a number of other things. Something that's interesting that I didn't point out is that uh, in terms of hereditable effects, now at, at doses around, again, 100 gram, if you have that, uh, or 200 gram, if you have that during the first trimester for a pregnant woman, then that can cause birth defects. Uh, but they're not genetic defects. They're, it's kind of like a, a fetal alcohol syndrome. The, when these massive doses in the first trimester prevent uh, proper growth. And uh, so there are a lot of other effects, but what we have not yet seen in humans is any heritable effects. So like the Incredible Hulk, Spider-Man, X-Men, those kinds of things, uh, uh, Godzilla. Uh, we've seen it in some animals, like uh, uh, some animals have seen it, but usually the doses required to get heritable effects tend to be up near the lethal range. So uh, that may be why we haven't seen it in humans yet, because the, you know, it typically will require massive doses. Great question. Uh, another, another question that came in, um, 10,000 milliram ha has to be all at one time for observable metal, medical effects, correct? Uh, and yes, so that, so that it has to be acute exposures. There's a, there's a very strong dose rate dependency. And so when it came to the, uh, the, that one paper at, at 10 rem, uh, that was for radiography patients, uh, uh, pediatric radiography. So those are acute, large, massive acute doses. So yes, it, it does need to be all at once uh, an acute exposure for that to take place. That's correct. Okay. Uh, another question that came in, uh, how do you address the claims that building out fission power plants would take longer than would be necessary in order to combat the permanent effects of climate change? Oh, that's a great question. Well, it, it, the, the, the actual median age is around six years. Uh, so it, the, 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 a common narrative that you have out there, it'll take 10 to 20 years. And it can if it's opposed. If, uh, if you take someone to court and you say you got to prove in court that, uh, that you will never contaminate the water or that you'll never contaminate the air, then, then that can hold it up. But the median age, if you look at the literature, it's actually about six years. And you can actually do it faster if, you do, if you're doing a number of them. There are some that were done in as short as three years. And so it comes down to these issues here, uh, right, in, in terms of uh, how much long-term impact you want to have on the environment. Is it worth investing in nuclear to prevent the environmental damage that you get from these renewables? Is it worth investing in nuclear to be able to use only a small footprint? Is it worth investing in nuclear to also give you greenhouse gas free? And it, it, the fact that we have historically not invested in it as using that as a justification to not do it in the future seems to me to be uh, uh, very, very bad, uh, a very bad approach. All right, uh, kind of a related question to the last one, but one of the most famous claims on nuclear industry is the huge cost. What are the procedures taken to make nuclear reactors competitive to other sources of energy? Well, the, the, the current mantra is to go with small modular reactors so that you're doing most of the manufacturing in a factory and then you just assemble it on site. Uh, the, the expectation that it's economies of scale. Um, the fact that it gives you base load energy that will allow you to actually have uh, wind and solar should you choose to do that, you, you're going to need base load. And currently most of the base load is fossil fuels. Uh, 
natural gas, if you have combined cycle, it's got a much lower greenhouse gas emission uh, per energy extracted. And so uh, if you if you do want it to be cheap, then you know you're going to go with coal. Um, uh, if that's your priority. If your priority is the environment, then you need to think outside of coal. And I would argue, hands down, unequivocally, nuclear is the most environmentally friendly option. Uh, but again, when you design that car so that it's safe enough, that it can roll down the cliff, fall into the river, get on fire, land on a rock, and have a person get up and walk out, that car is not going to be cheap. Uh, especially building the first one or the first few, it's going to be really difficult to build that car. But if we decide that that's the way we're going to build our cars and we start making a lot of them, then eventually they will get cheap. But to start off with, it won't. All right. Thank you. Another question that came in. Uh, after the biological tissue is exposed to the radiation, part at least is absorbed by the tissue. How does it dissipate or decay in the body so that the radiation is not all cumulative? Oh, wow. Great question. Okay. The vast majority of the radiation absorbed in the body is just turns into heat. Uh, very little of it will actually uh, cause a chemical change. Now, you can get like radiolysis, and that can occur. But the majority of it just is going to uh, result in heating up the body. A very small fraction of it uh, can result in double strand breaks of the DNA. And the body has the ability to repair double strand breaks, but there is an expectation that, it, that the more often that happens, then the more chance that you have that you're going to get a genetic defect that will or could turn into cancer that the body would then uh, might be overwhelmed with if you've got, say, morbidity cofactors so that you're not able to stave that off. Uh, the point is, is it's just another insult to the body. Um, whether you're actually going with this, actually, I actually have a slide on this. Uh, it's uh, the linear no threshold. So a lot of people uh, will adopt this. A lot of people reject this. The, the idea with the linear no threshold is that those doses that we were talking about that were below any measurable medical effect, those are doses that are right down here. What we see here is that you see dose as a function of excess relative risk, uh, whether we're talking about the Chernobyl cleanup workers uh, or whether we're talking about uh, atomic bomb survivors. Now, the doses, again, they're down in this range right here. So you got to ask yourself, what's actually occurring down here? Is there actually, is it, is it linear like this? So that if there's a, there is a non-zero risk and non-zero dose, um, or is it? Uh, do you have hormesis or linear width threshold? Hormesis is the model that um, because radiation increased exponentially, as you go back in time, uh, our true design specification is higher radiation levels, uh, and so a little bit is good for you. There are those that believe that, and there is some evidence for that. Uh, that that's the case for rats, for example. With rats, a little bit of radiation is good for them. It helps to prevent cancer. Uh, we're not rats, so maybe that applies, maybe it doesn't. Another model that's normal, that's, that's often used, is linear width threshold. The idea being that there is some form of homeostasis that the body does. So you can change the exterior, exterior temperature, and the body can regulate itself. Uh, you can exchange, uh, change the external pressure and vibration, and within a certain range, the body can regulate itself and be fine. And the argument is the same as with radiation, right? Radiation is normal, it's natural at a certain level, and there are certain variations that you get, and as long as you stay within those normal variations for natural background, uh, the body will regulate itself. And then finally, then there's the linear uh, no threshold, which is the most conservative, and because it's the most conservative, that's what we use for regulation. We always default to the worst case when it comes to nuclear engineering, and that's the worst case, and it's also the easiest, basically, to interpret. And so a lot of people think that that's the true model that you have, and it's not. That's just one, of, one possible way to fit the data that's here. You can see that the data is entirely uncertain. There's just a lot of uncertainty there. So it might be true that it is, but it could just as well be true that it's a, a hormesis or a linear uh, width threshold. Again, 10 rem is that minimum. So uh, that that radiation largely is just heat, um, but at large enough doses, uh, when you start to get up here, then you actually will get excess relative risk that's measurable, that's statistically significant at large doses, substantially larger than those that are uh, deal with regulation. The regulations intentionally keep doses well below anything that's gonna have a measurable medical effect. Great question. All right, uh, no, another question is, is there any chance to resurrect the Yucca Mountain as at the National Spent Fuel Repository? Oh, uh, it's 
that, so that would be a choice that would have to come from uh, uh, our, our legislatures, right? The, the president and Congress and the Senate, uh, they would have to do that. It's been unfunded. Uh, so if there's no funding, there's nothing that's going to happen. Um, and right now, the, the path forward is what's called consent-based siting. Uh, with consent-based siting, that would mean that you would basically have to define consent and then obtain consent from the people of Nevada. And uh, that's probably not going to happen in this generation. Well, it could happen in a future generation, but I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Okay, and this is probably the last question we have time for. Uh, what are your thoughts on the potential of fusion power given recent breakthroughs related to that field? Um, so we actually have a fusion expert here at NC State, and he pointed out that uh, it's at least 10 years off before we could actually start designing a, a, a fusion reactor, assuming that the ITER works. So if the ITER works, then we could do that. Um, issues with fusion are that you're limited to deuterium tritium. And where are you getting the tritium from? Right now we get it from fission reactors. Uh, the ITER design would not work for deuterium deuterium. So the ocean is filled with deuterium. It's, even though it's at a very small percentage, the ocean is really big. Similarly, the ocean has about 4 billion tons of uranium, should you choose to extract that. But if you were to extract the deuterium for a fusion, then unless you're making tritium somehow, like say with a blanket for the, the ITER, you have to make that tritium to actually make an ITER design work. We don't actually have anything that is, 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 is looking like it's got viability for deuterium-deuterium fusion. Uh, and so with deuterium fission, or sorry, deuterium tritium, uh, we're still quite a ways, uh, quite a long ways out before anything like that starts to be made. And even then, it's only going to be large installations. With the ITER, you're looking at something that needs to have a gigawatt. So anything that has a small energy need, that's going to be difficult without a lot of transmission to get that uh, energy transported over long distances. All right, well, that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayes, for another outstanding webinar presentation. Uh, if I did not get to your question, I'm going to try to capture them and maybe I can send them to Dr. Hayes uh, to get an offline answer. But uh, for sure, please um, check this out, this presentation out on YouTube. should be up by early next week. Uh, I would highly recommend if you're interested in this topic to follow Dr. Hayes, Robert Hayes on LinkedIn. Uh, he posts a lot of videos, um, short videos, digestible videos where you can... Um, uh, get some information about nuclear energy and this whole nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, a lot of interesting information. Uh, but Dr. Hayes, thank you again, and thank you everyone for participating. Have a good day. You too.